This is Anarchast. Hey everybody, welcome to the edition of Anarchast. I have a very special guest today, Bob Murphy, a well-known author, Austrian economist, has his own website. Uh, he's written many books, including The Politically Incorrect Guide to the Great Depression and Chaos Theory, which is uh, some essays on anarchism. So he's definitely one uh, guy that we definitely wanted to talk to. So we're very happy to have you on. Thanks, Bob. Thanks for having me. Yeah, and we're here at Porkfest. As you know, we just had Stephanie Murphy, no relation, I don't believe. On I don't think so you. either. <laughs> and uh, yeah, and so, uh, you know, the first question I always like to ask everyone is how did you become an anarchist? Well, it was just a matter of consistency. I distinctly remember I was into Austrian economics. I called myself, my progression was a conservative, then a libertarian, and I remember reading Rothbard's For a New Liberty, and I was amused. I was like, I remember saying to my parents, whoa, this guy doesn't just want to cut taxes, he wants to get rid of taxes, this guy's crazy. <laughs> and then, uh, I don't know, I w it was just thinking through the logic of it, I guess, and just seeing more and more examples of how governments uh, not only in the abstract are they doing things that seem a little bit dubious, but even pragmatically they weren't achieving the goals that they were supposed to. And as the more and more I saw that at some point I just realized they don't even provide law and defense. Like that was my last holdout to say, oh, you need a government right. for that stuff. And then once that went, you know, it was, and then it was just refreshing. So I, that happened, I think, my freshman year in college is when I finally made that switch to say, okay, I'm an anarchist. Wow, that's great. And uh, so would you uh, credit Murray Rothbard with pushing over the edge or well, he's, any one moment? Yeah, I mean, he certainly equipped me with the, the theoretical tools, but like I said, it wasn't that I read him and was converted. I read him and then was aware of this position that was out there that's, that claimed to be like the logical conclusion of where my thought was headed, but I resisted it at first and then I don't, I don't know what it was that made it click. I think it was just I had this stuff building up and there was this tension in my mind of, you know, this cognitive dissonance. Yes. And then it just, uh, I think some of it too was just seeing the government in practice just how much they lie and you know what I mean like after a while you realize maybe on paper they could do this stuff but do you actually trust real world politicians and bureaucrats with your safety and liberty and so and then just I realized these people can't be trusted yeah I forget the exact quote but one, someone once said that uh, when you're young if you're a, a liberal if you're not a liberal you're a, you're you're a cold-hearted and when you're older if you're not a conservative then uh, do you know the exact quote? I think it's, yeah, when you're, you're young and not a liberal, you don't have a heart. And if you're old and not conservative, you don't have a brain. Right. I think it's the, yeah. And, well, the brain part isn't quite correct on the conservative, but on the anarchy side, for sure. And and like you just pointed out, I think a lot of people, including myself, when I was younger, I I was more leaning conservative, although I, I knew there was something wrong there, but I, I, I couldn't figure out what the problem was. Uh, but as you actually have some... Uh, uh, experience in life you start to realize how things actually work as opposed mm -hmm. to how you know on paper oh on paper socialism sounds great right it just doesn't work it's right. been proven throughout history how many millions of people need to die right and uh, so you actually come from more of an Austrian economics background uh, did you get into that in university or I'd be surprised if you did well uh, no I was into it so, so it's funny people are surprised I think like around seventh grade I noticed that when my dad would drive me places in the car, he'd have on Rush Limbaugh's show, you know, real right-wing Republican yeah. conservative. But Rush, even though now I disagree with most of what he says, he does, you know, he would pay lip service to the free market, and then he would say, and so I started reading into that area, reading this, my dad had this thing called the Conservative Chronicle, which was like a compendium of op-eds put out by so-called conservatives. And my favorite ones, I realized, were the ones by the economists, like Thomas Sowell and Walter Williams. And so they were real, you know, talking about free trade and minimum wage laws and things like that. I was like, oh, wow, this is really it was exciting stuff. And then I got into Milton Friedman and Henry Hazlitt. And then he, in the beginning of his book, he mentioned this guy Ludwig von Mises. So to answer your question, by the time I was a senior in high school, I got human action wow. and read it cover to cover. I didn't understand a lot of it. All but, on your own? Uh, yeah, wow. right. Yeah, like when I went to visit Hillsdale College, which is where I went to school, I was elated because Richard Ebeling was one other person who knew who Mises was at that point, you wow. know, that I met him. So the, yeah, up till then it was just a pure... I'm just surprised you found it all without any anyone really pushing you towards it. Yeah, yeah well, it, it was just, and, and what's funny is that encourages me when I'm writing op-eds and things, and I, and sometimes, you know, you have a deadline, or it's like, oh, I gotta get this 700 words into this guy by tomorrow, and I remind myself there are some kids out there that are gonna read 
this little dinky op-ed in a newspaper I write on, you know, the debt limit or something, and if I just refer to Hayek or whatever, like, they might say, who's this guy? And it kind of reminds me that when I was young, it took me reading some guy's op-ed to yeah. go down, you know, because you, you're right, you're not just going to go to the library and say, oh, do you have any really thick economics books that's just, that's not how you're going to get like into totally it. Like totally unaccepted economics book by right, the establishment. Right, exactly, yeah. So it's, it's that it does encourage it and it reminds me that, like, it's important to say things that you think are obvious because someone in the crowd hasn't heard it before. Right, yeah. Oh, definitely. Um, I always find Austrian economics interesting because I was, once I learned about it and knew what it was, I just thought it's just economics. Everything else is just wrong. <laughs> you know? Like, do you see it as being right or wrong? Do you see, or do you, how would you even describe someone, what is Austrian economics? Would, like, let, I'd like to hear your definition of what that is. Okay. Um, well, I, I don't know this is like if, if I were doing it for a textbook or something, I might give you something different, but yeah, but someone. you're right. What I say is Austrian economics, it focuses on, it, so first of all, it, it actually tries to explain the real economy. So it doesn't try to make a model that is internally consistent and then we can say statements about this model and then it's up in the air whether it's applicable to the real world. Like Austrians, whether they succeed or not, set out to explain what actually happens in the marketplace. Like that's what their goal is or the task they set for themselves. So that's one difference. And then it's a, it's a logical thing just thinking through the consequences of certain ways of viewing the world. So it's, I think the Austrians are aware that it's like a, a perspective. So it's not that it's right or wrong in the sense that, oh, it might turn out to be wrong. That the way, what it is, it's, it's just a way of viewing the world and it might be useful or not, but it's, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't test it. It's like, like supply and demand curves. You could never disprove them. It's just the worst that would ever happen is economists might, in 200 years might say, this is kind of a clumsy way to categorize things. Let's use some other framework. But I mean, a supply curve is just whatever, you know, it's true by definition. You know what I mean? So the Austrians is sort of like that. The, the one, the thing that distinguishes Austrians from other economists right now that's relevant is they have a pretty rich understanding of the capital structure. And so that gives rise to why Bernanke's monetary policies screw things up and how the Austrians think that the business cycle happens. You can't even explain that to a mainstream economist because in their models, the mainstream models, there's like one capital good and they label it K. And you, you can't have a, an unsustainable boom in that kind of framework. And so that, I think that's what, I mean, it, that's, so that's not the definition of Austrian, but that's one major difference that I think is really relevant. It's basically based on human action, right? So it's not looking at it macro, is that correct? Like, I, 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 I that, Yeah, that understand. is, yes, that is true that Austrians tend to build things up, you know, they would call it like a micro foundation. So yeah. yeah, so they do have views about price inflation in the business cycle, which tend to be called macro issues. But the explanation is not going to be, oh, because MV was too high or whatever, you know what I mean, that they're going to try to ultimately ground it in interest rates did such and such and that gave people different incentives and then individual businesses did such and such. And then in the aggregate, all these individuals doing that, what's going to happen? But you're right, it's, they try to explain things at the individual level. And for someone, say a younger person who might be thinking going into economics in university and like not at... Uh, one of the top sort of Austrian, like uh, in Mises or anything like that, but like just a regular standard, let's say Harvard. Um, what would you say to them about doing that? Would you say, what, what would you say? The, the question is, what if someone can if get into Harvard? Yeah, if there's, are they going to take economics at Harvard? What would you say to them? Would you say it's a complete waste of time? Or uh, what percentage of oh. it do you think is good or bad it, that they're going to learn? If there were somebody who in undergrad is totally in Austrian economics, has read Human Action, Man, Economy, and State, maybe went to the Mises Institute or FEE or something and you know reads my blog, that kind of stuff. And the person's smart enough and has the GRE scores and is good enough at math to get into Harvard's PhD program for economics, I would say go ahead and do that because then you're gonna have a lot of credibility. Uh, so, like, so I went to NYU, which at the time I think was in the top 20 of you know pr programs around the world, so that was pretty prestigious. You know, more it was a it was a high more high more highly ranked department than a lot of other departments that are like more traditionally considered Austrian departments or Austrian friendly. And so the benefit, I mean, so the, the downside was I was kind of lonely there. You know, there were the Mario Rizzo and Israel Kirzner were there, and they had the Austrian colloquium. But my classmates were like, "What the heck is this Austrian?" So, you know, so I felt isolated, and it really was depressing psychologically. But 
the, the upside is I really know mathematical utility theory. I really know game theory. You know, so when, when, when we, as an Austrian, when I want to say, oh, the mainstream believes such and such, I mean, I could do the theorems, whereas some other Austrians, I can kind of tell, didn't really do the hardcore math. So they're just like speaking from secondhand sources uh, about, oh, this is what Samuelson was dabbling in, but they don't really know Whereas I had to do it like on my homework problem sets. So it's not for everybody, but I do think it is good if a few Austrians go through that so we can have credibility when we want to contrast the two approaches. Like Roger Garrison's really good too, that when he's doing his PowerPoints to a, a mixed crowd and he can take the Aust you know, he can take Hayek's story and put it in mainstream terminology. And, and the people in the crowd can realize, like, oh, yeah, that is how we talk. Whereas if you're bluffing a little bit, then a mainstream person says, we don't believe that, you know, and you lose credibility. That's a very interesting perspective. I never thought about it that way. Um, switching topics a little bit, you're here at Porkfest. Yep. Uh, I think it's your first time, right? Second. Oh, it's your second yep. time. Yep. Okay. And uh, so what do you think about the whole thing here? It is no exaggeration to say Porkfest is my favorite week of the year. Uh, this is the one time when I allow myself to have a vacation, as it were. I just try to get all my work done and come out Sorry here. Sorry to make you work for half an hour. Well, but this is this is fun. You know, <laughs> okay. I mean, I do panels and stuff too. That's not work. Okay. Uh, what I mean, like my day job stuff. Uh, I try to job. try to get that out of the way. Um, it's yeah. What, what I tell people is, it's it's one thing to go to an academic type conference, and th there's a role for that. And I love those things too. And places like Mises University is very fun, also. Mm -hmm. But Porkfest is really fun. And the other thing is. I get the sense that the people are living liberty here more so than other, other places we're studying it. We're like telling stories and thought experiments about right. a group of free people would do such and such, I bet. <laughs> and this is how they'd resolve problems. And here you can see, well, that guy was being a jerk last night. How did we deal with that? We didn't call the cops. What happened? And so, or, you know, oh, Jesus. I mean, this is silly, but the first year I came, I packed protein bars in my suitcase because I was afraid we'd get out here and I'd be gnawing bark off of trees or something. And of course, there's all kinds of ethnic food and everything because entrepreneurs realize there's going to be hundreds of people here without food. They're going to have money in their pockets. And so I'll bring food and it's silly stuff, but it, it, it really underscored for me that, yeah, a group of free people who are committed to property rights can get along without some monopoly agency punishing them. Absolutely. Yeah, one of my favorite food here is that George's baklava. Yeah. Which, oh, he's so good. And he actually advertises on uh, one of my favorite uh, radio programs. Uh, uh, oh, I forget the name of it. Wheels Off Liberty? Wheels Off Liberty, yes. And they're on later tonight. I'm really looking forward to that. Um, yeah, so it is cool to see how what they're doing here and, and that sort of a thing. And uh, is there anything else you wanted to say about Porkfest or, or what's going on around here? Well, I, I really, it, it's kind of a pain to get out here unless yes. you live locally. So, I mean, there is that aspect. But I would just encourage people to give it a shot because it, it really is. And it, it works better the, the more people come. So it's not just academics and that's really what distinguishes this event from other ones that I'm typically associated with the other places there's a bunch of college professors and students coming to hear lectures and here there are lectures there is a scholarly aspect to it but then there's a bunch of fun stuff too and there's things like panels on parents telling if if you don't want if you want to homeschool your kid and how do you make sure that your kid doesn't get blackballed by the system or you don't have the government showing up at your doorstep because you didn't you know fill out some form so real practical things about what if you want to live your life as free as possible, but it's realistic. You know, I mean, it's not just a bunch of college kids dreaming. I mean, this is really people say, oh, gee, do, do you guys pay your taxes? What do you do to you? You know, and just things like that that come up. And yet here there's hundreds of people who live this on a daily basis because in conjunction with the Free State Project. And so there's a lot of real world experience and you can see what people did in their real life as opposed to again just reading something Rothbard wrote speculating on what would happen. Absolutely. Uh, one thing I forgot to bring up when I was talking about going to Harvard was that you actually do some courses on the internet, is that correct? Yep, it's uh, Mises Academy, so it's academy.mises.org is the website and yeah it's uh, it's the best of both worlds because I used to teach at Hillsdale College and that was the upper level courses I really enjoyed because th those were the electives, so the econ majors who wanted to take a class from me signed up for that. But the ones I didn't like so much were the lower level, just like everyone who was taking a business major had to take principles of micro. And oh, I got this Murphy guy, oh my gosh. you know. And I, I didn't like having people in the room because they were forced to be there kind of. you know. Yeah. Well, we're and so, we don't Right, them. right, exactly. I mean, it wasn't literal force, but you know what I mean. <laughs> Almost. And so with the online stuff, I really like it because everyone there is 
paid for it. You know, they wanted to be, they're not, it's not even accredited. It might be down the road, but right now, so they're there because they want to learn. And so it allows me to still teach, but yet not have to deal with all the bureaucracy of a conventional teaching post. Yeah. So, and there's, yeah, lots of, there's more, it's not just me. There's lots of different people, history, philosophy, all of course from the Austrian libertarian perspective, but I definitely would encourage people to look at academy.mises.org if they're interested. Definitely our cameraman right now, Christian Kofod, son of Pete Kofod, who was on Anarchast. He's one of your students. Yep, yep. He was very excited to meet you. And I think that's so awesome what's going on with the internet. You know, guys like you, if, if you wanted to learn from it, you'd have to go there. And now you don't even have to do that. Some kid in Nigeria could be sitting there learning uh, Austrian economics from Bob Murphy. It's yeah, and it's not, that's not much. I, I don't think I have any from Nigeria per se, but there are people from China, Australia, yeah. all over. The, so it literally is, I mean, I think it's probably the U.S. is the most represented country, but it is a global thing at this point. And what, the other benefit, too, is it makes it more feasible for people to go and get a Ph.D. in an Austrian economics field or topic because they can earn a living just teaching online classes, whereas before it would be difficult. You know, you can't get 20 people consistently sign up for your classes that are in one physical spot at a school because yeah. just, there's not enough market demand for it. But if you've got the whole world to work with, it can work. Yeah, there's actually a website by a TDD subscriber uh, called eProf.com, and they're basically doing that where you can become a teacher online. And the cool thing is, if you're really good, you're going to get more and more people watching your videos, sort of like the Khan Academy. And if you're not very good, then no one will watch your videos. Right. So it's sort of the free market for education. Like exactly. education can really just be so fantastic mm -hmm. if it's unrestrained from the state. Yeah, and th that's the good thing too. It, it has forced me to be to spend more time preparing my lectures because, by the same token. That we got into the bad dynamic. I told you when the business kids had to come to my class and they were bored out of their mind. Well, I didn't put so much into it either because it was kind of like, oh, they're going to hate me anyway. And so what's the point? They have to take my class. But if you know your livelihood, that the amount of money you're going to get is directly dependent on how many people enroll, then you want to put on a show. And so it really does make you prepare more. And so, yeah, it's, it's better all around than the conventional educational model. That's great. Well, uh, I think we're running out of time here on the on the battery on the camera, but uh, uh, you have a blog or some other places that people can find your information? Yeah, my uh, website is consultingbyrpm.com. So just one word, consulting, B-Y-R-P-M. All right. That's Bob Murphy, one of the top guys in Austrian economics. And uh, that's all from Porkfest for right now. Peace, love, <laughs> and anarchy.